It's great to be back at DEF CON after such a tumultuous time over the past few years. A lot of us have gone through a lot of personal and societal issues and to come together to celebrate and to look at all the changes that have happened over the past few years in the ecosystem and the things that didn't really change over the past few years as well. So DEF CON is actually a perfect example of us trying to expose the community and the culture to the needs in different regions of the world. And it's quite clear by the different feedback that we've been getting that the reactions that people are really not truly close to empathizing or understanding the needs of others when it comes to really benefiting the individuals that would uh, be able to make the use of the technology to the most of their benefit. Um, so I believe the many of you that are sitting in this room uh, have truly made this your life's work for the past few years and will be the individuals that kind of look at how we can look at uh, Ethereum as an ecosystem and what needs to be done to maintain the decentralization. So I wanted to kind of take this opportunity uh, to step back and really examine from a uh, pragmatic approach, maybe somewhat of a therapy session with these individuals in the room and look at like what has been really exam what has been happening in the ecosystem and how can we look at uh, what's been going wrong and why are we really here and where do we need to focus our energies uh, and what are we hoping to create as an impact from a global perspective for participants that come from very disparate and unique backgrounds and lived experiences. So let's face it, we have a problem. Um, all of us have this notion and mental model of can't someone else do it when it comes to maintaining and running services uh, when we have to participate in, within this network. And in a roundabout way, we've kind of just adopted this same mentality that we had coming into Web3 from the Web2 ecosystem as a whole. So I wasn't kidding when I said this would be somewhat of a therapy session and we'd look at uh, what is happening as far as behavior change. Uh, so in order to do that, I wanted to look at the trans theoretical model of behavior change. So there are five stages of change uh, that have been conceptualized for a variety of problems and behaviors. So the first stage is basically pre-contemplation. So these are individuals that are not really ready to make any change. Um, they might be unaware or underaware of the issues that are happening. Uh, so maybe there's a few individuals in this room that, don't really, that aren't really aware of the issues that we are facing when it comes to decentralization in the ecosystem. Then there's individuals that are kind of in this contemplation stage where they're aware of the problems, but they're not really mindful or seriously thinking about overcoming them in any meaningful manner. And then there's no commitment to take any action. So I think that's kind of the space a lot of us kind of occupy at this point is we're aware of the problems, but we really haven't done any preparation or are ready to do any action to change those things. So the next stage is basically preparation and that combines like the intention of wanting to create some change and then uh, looking at some of the behavioral criteria to make that change in the first place and then intending to take some action in the first place. So from there, we go to the action stage, and this is, I think, where the biggest issue happens within the ecosystem is that we get prepared, but we just don't have the tools or the resources to take any action to create that change. Um, so this is the stage where individuals actually have to modify their behavior, they have to change their experiences, environment, and they have in order to overcome their problems. And this requires uh, quite the overt behavioral changes and considerable, considerable amount of commitment and energy and resources. Then from that, we go to the maintenance. So basically people work to prevent relapse and the work that had been done in the action phase. Um, and then obviously there's relapse and I think this is the point of uh, place where we are in the ecosystem where we've kind of reverted to making decisions in the hopes of mass adoption that kind of compromise the decisions when it comes to decentralization. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit. So we postulate quite a bit on Twitter and other social media channels around like, what are the issues, but there's really no action or force put behind them. So my objective today is to kind of like help some of the individuals that are in the room to move from this pre-contemplation phase to something that is a little bit more actionable or uh, at least prepared for them to do so. So decentralization has kind of been touted as this core to the Ethereum of Web3 ecosystem, yet we continue to operate in a world where the end users have been trained and programmed to not think about any of the infrastructure that they need to run to utilize some of the services or the technologies that we utilize. Um, so it means that 
they're not really aware of how these things operate, how secure they are, how they're managed, and what are the trade-offs when you actually get to um, making those trade-offs when you actually start to rely on these intermediaries to come and facilitate some of this technology. And the community just continues to operate with the same mantra of can someone else do it that we have been programmed to do so within the Web2 ecosystem. Um, but it's kind of interesting to also look at the different cohorts of people that come into the ecosystem. So throughout the years, these individuals hold very different values and their mode of operation is quite distinct as well. So if you really wanted to examine the people that are giving talks at DEF CON, you'll be able to kind of guesstimate where and when in the ecosystem they kind of entered. So from like 2010 to 2012 onwards, these were individuals that were kind of cypherpunks. They were crypto punks and they were crypto anarchists. They wanted to take control back from the state. As you go towards the 2014s, 2016s, these are individuals that are more game theorists. These are uh, system design thinkers. These are individuals that are thinking about more mechanism designs and so forth. And then as you go into the later years, these are individuals that are more aligned with business cases and user adoption. So the place that I kind of came into the ecosystem was around 2016, where I was sold this vision of Web3 being my portal into anything that I want to do with privacy, user interactions, and so forth. So the first thing that I, as a PC user, wanted to interact with Ethereum was there's no ICO boom, there's no rise in token prices at this point. So all I could do was to interact with Ethereum was try to run a node. And the first thing that I tried to do was uh, look at the Mist browser. And I was able to get it running, uh, but the issue was that it wasn't able to sync. So the next option was the Parity UI, ran it, was able to get it to sync, but there was no features or anything functional that would kind of keep me utilizing that service and kind of interact with the Ethereum network in any meaningful manner. So then at the same time, Status and Jared were kind of like evangelizing this uh, Ethereum for mobile vision where you could have node infrastructure on a mobile device. You can interact with these web three technologies through Whisper, et cetera. And this was around 2016 and we're in 2022 and I want to interact with Ethereum. What do I have? Command line interfaces. It's unfortunate, but there's a lot of inf infrastructure work that needs to be done, a lot of resources and issues that have come up that has still led us to a position where normal users that want to interact with the network state can do that in a meaningful manner. They can't run nodes, they can't run infrastructure because there's just no easy way for them to do so. So one thing that we come to realize time and time again is that users will always give up their liberties for convenience. And this happens within social media networks where the users give up their data, privacy, just for the sake of quick access and the ability to interact with certain use cases that are not available and that doesn't require them to actually run any infrastructure or node services, et cetera. And they really don't have the bandwidth or the time or the allocation to actually worry about some of this stuff when it comes to running infrastructure. So we get into this situation where we're kind of like the, the citizens of Springfield and we just want someone else to take care of all our problems and we just kind of operate within that mental framework. Um, and I think it's, it's really a disservice to the ecosystem and the, the intended purpose of why we are here in the first place uh, because we want control over our data, we want control over our uh, privacy and that we're in just a position where we're relying on intermediaries and putting a lot of trust in them to give us what we should be um, optimizing for. So when we look at who is there to blame, it, it is the, the ecosystem as a whole and the key decisions that we have made when it comes to trying to optimize for whether it's adoption or other consequences of technology limitations that have been there. So what does decentralization currently look like in the Ethereum ecosystem? It's, 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 you have to be kind of mindful and kind of step back and actually evaluate that most of the key ownership or individuals that actually invest in crypto tokens, et cetera, hold their keys on centralized exchanges. So there's, there's a centralized party taking control of this stuff in the first place. When it comes to node infrastructure, majority of nodes are actually running on Amazon AWS and cloud services. So you're kind of back at ground zero again. Similarly, when it comes to data availability or getting access to uh, the transactions and so forth, you're relying on Infura. When it comes to staking, a lot of the staking is actually consolidated on staking pools or centralized exchanges at this point, which is a huge problem uh, when you do get into censorship and those organizations having to kind of function within certain jurisdictions and laws that they must abide by. 
Additionally, when it comes to network security, uh, we have issues with client diversity. So like the major execution client is GET, which occupies close to 80%, which is a huge issue when it comes to network security. Additionally, we did have issues with Prism being a majority client, but the community did a lot of energy and focus on that. We're at a good position there, but still there is a lot of work that needs to be done there. And when it comes to dApps or other resources, um, you know, you're basically reliant on things like OpenSea, which are not very uh, decentralized in any manner as well. So unless you really run an Ethereum node, you're not, you're like trusting third parties to provide you access to the blockchain, and which is not really the, the, the core value of what we were trying to achieve. So you're not really truly participating in this P2P network. Uh, you're not property, propagating your own transactions to the network. You're dependent on things like MetaMask to connect to Infura. And then you're looking at Etherscan and just giving this inherent uh, trust to these organizations and these services to provide you the information that you're looking for and for it to be accurate in the first place. So when you look at like the, the participation of the current POS validator nodes within the context of the world, you can see that majority of the individuals that are participating are within the North America and Europe regions. And this is a concern as far as diversity is concerned as well. You can see there's a bit of action within the East Asian communities, but that is still very limited. And it's quite interesting to kind of like map this to the participation from um, Ethereum global online hackers. It kind of maps quite, uh, Nicely, aside from the fact that there's a lot of developer activity happening in India, but there isn't too much uh, staking happening there. So I think it's good to know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done as far as making sure that we've created the ecosystem and the resources for these network participants to come in from these locations that might not have the resources to do so. So 32 Ether is a lot of money for individuals in Latin America or Africa or Asia. So how do we get resources and technologies that kind of help them participate in the network? And staking is not the only way for them to participate in the network. So they can run nodes, they can learn, run light clients, they can run other services and really think about how they can get some sort of participation within the network that doesn't rely on them investing money. And perhaps we can even look at how can incentivize those individuals and monetize or compensate those individuals to be participants in the first place as well, which we can talk about a little bit later. So it's clear that this, these things don't seem like an issue until they become an issue, and that at that point it's just too late for you to do anything. So we've seen a little bit of a glimpse of this um, when it comes to Web2 hacks, et cetera, but most recently when it comes to Tornado Cash. So I said one of the biggest issues or the blames was on us, but there's other factors and other uh, forces kind of functioning towards making some of this a little bit more difficult for us to decentralize and um, not be functioning within the current uh, systems that do exist. Uh, and that's one of those things is like adversar adversarial uh, state actors. So uh, as we saw with Tornado Cash, I'm not a legal expert or anything, but uh, so I won't speak too heavily on this. And I think there's probably other talks within DEF CON that kind of go into this route, but they were basically uh, put on the OFAC sanction list. And then the developers were added to this SDN list, which doesn't, does, doesn't make sense from a uh, perspective of the law at that point. And then on top of that, crypto projects are banned in countries like China and India, where there's a lot of developer activity, but they just don't have the opportunity to work on these technologies in the first place. In addition, the third forcing factor is that there's individuals which are kind of uh, classified as mad adoption vultures. These are individuals that come in, take the narrative that you've been working on for the past X amount of years, and then co-opt it for their own benefit. So these are the Elon Musk, these are the, uh, Jack Dorsey's, these are the Mark Zuckerbergs who are just waiting by the side that it, once they see their opportunity, they're gonna jump on the narrative and take it for their own benefit. So when you see Elon Musk tweeting uh, these dot coins and making people those coins kind of jump up in value, a lot of people invest in them, kind of follow that trend, and when they lose money, that reflects uh, adversely on the ecosystem as a whole. So all the work that you've done now gets marred by this uh, rug pull that was kind of like facilitated by this individual that just was having fun creating memes on the internet. Similarly, uh, we've seen what these social media companies do when it comes to feature releases. One social media company releases a feature, two weeks later, everyone has the same features within their applications. Similarly, these individuals are just waiting for their opportunity to kind of co-opt what you're doing and then utilize their it for their benefit. You've seen this with uh, Zuckerberg kind of reframing this his whole organization around meta worse and whatnot. 
Similarly, with Jack Dorsey, he's always pushing for Bitcoin and decentralization, but we haven't seen too much come out of that. So one thing that I wanted to kind of get into was addressing users' needs. So if you were thinking about what needs to be done moving forward, is that we need to meet the users halfway or where they are. Um, that means that if people or majority of the world is using PCs and we want individuals to stake or participate in uh, managing nodes or creating validators, et cetera, maybe we create interfaces or documentation that's a little bit easier for those individuals to understand. So this is the ease of access. And then as I was mentioning earlier, there's this part about incentive alignment. So what does it look like for people to participate in the Ethereum network? We kind of confuse it with just staking at this point, but there's other opportunities for individuals to actually a, communicate and get participation, participation within the network uh, through running nodes, running light clients and other services that can be of a meaningful manner. But like, how do you incentivize them? How do you create resources or infrastructure for them to even do that in the first place? Uh, additionally, you have to kind of like take them through this progressive disclosure phase where you can't just chuck them in the deep end of uh, uh, decentralization as they start to make those uh, movements towards action, you kind of help them and guide them towards that just, uh, movement towards decentralization in the first place. And that kind of leads into the guided education and encouragement of those individuals. So as you start moving up uh, of the, the use cases, you make sure that those individuals are provided the sufficient guidance and the encouragement to continue and maintain the changes and the behaviors that they have implemented. Additionally, we need to make sure that there's relevant context and narrative framing for the individuals that we're speaking to. So the framing that you have around Web3 and the challenges that you face with financial uh, restrictions or censorship, et cetera, is not the same that the individuals in Bogota face or the people that in Africa face or the people that face in India. And this, this is the context that we need to be aware of to make sure that the framing is uh, maneuvered in a way that they understand why they should be decentralizing in the first place and what does that mean for them and how does that benefit them in the long run. So I think one thing that I would encourage for everyone to start doing on their own to if they really value privacy or security and want to re like reduce reliance on third party servers and improve censorship resistance or improve health or decentralization of the network is to take ownership and participate in the network themselves. And this means running a node or whatever it may be. Ethereum.org has been doing a great job of creating these resources that, easy, that are easy to understand and that have a lot of translations for different regions. And I would encourage everyone to kind of start digging into some of these more resources online and try to understand where we kind of started as an ecosystem and where we have kind of ended up in the past few years. Additionally, if there's individuals in this room that are quite passionate about creating this change for the ecosystem, I would encourage them to come to Adoption Day. It's a UXN conference where we have uh, quite a few interesting lightning talks from individuals from Optimism, um, from uh, Status, from uh, different client teams to kind of really dig into these different issues and think about what we need to be thinking about in the short term and to the long term when it comes to the UX challenges, when it comes to adoption and make sure that decentralized is at the core, decentralization is at the core of any of the issues that we focus towards. So please be sure to add this to your schedule so we know how to plan for the room accordingly and make sure that we set it up uh, since it is a small workshop room. Uh, additionally, we'll have working groups focused on UX challenges between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. And then after that, we'll go to the Chiba Lounge, hopefully where Tomo will do a DJ set. So looking forward to that myself. Uh, additionally, at DEF CON this year, we really made a point to highlight teams and projects that are working on some of this stuff. So be sure to go to the client team, uh, Impact Boots. I know for a fact that Nimbus is working on user interfaces to make some of this stuff easier. Um, Lighthouse is working on some of this stuff. I know uh, Prism and uh, Lodestar have done some research and development in this regard as well. Do check out Ethereum on ARM, which is a small uh, device that you can actually start running a node on an ARM device. DAP nodes provide services along this, this uh, regard as well, same as Ethereum. So they're all in the impact booth area, so be sure to go check them out as well. Additionally, I think we just need to kind of go back to this diagram around why we were looking at the trans theoretical model of change and what we need to be mindful of. So it's always an upward spiral and we're always gonna relapse. 
And I think over the past few years, um, we've unfortunately relapsed to a point where we just don't want to take ownership of the uh, managing our services or infrastructure at all. And we're going to have to start looking at what infrastructure, what resources, what education needs to be put in place where people can now start actually preparing and putting things into action. So hopefully there's individuals in this room that can guide us, that can lead us, uh, move into more action-oriented mind frame rather than where we just contemplate and think about the issues that we are facing. But once we actually get to the point that it's too late, there's nothing that we can do. So I would like to thank everyone for coming today and hopefully you get an opportunity to engage with the thousands of individuals that are coming to DEF CON from disparate backgrounds and communicate with them and really learn about the challenges that they face when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, why are they here? Why are, did they want to participate in the Ethereum, whether it was creating resources, whether it's developing protocols, what really drives them and how do you take that context into the work that you're doing? I think it's quite imperative. And, Community efforts like DEF CON are amazing to see the, the consequence of what happens at these events. So you might see an idea spark at one of these talks that leads to a huge impact, not only monetarily, but just from an ecosystem-wide perspective uh, in the next few years. So be mindful of those conversations, take the opportunity to uh, really dig deep and think about the, the reason why we were here in the first place and how we can kind of continue moving towards that decentralized ecosystem. Thank you very much.